Good evening and welcome to tonight's driver's ed class. Thursday, the last day of week number one. So we're going to wait for people to jump on in. Remember to sign in on the comment section. Also make sure that you text me on your phone that you are here. That's our attendance. And we'll wait for people to join us. So far, driving has been going pretty good with the few that have signed up. Uh, I hope tonight that we are able to schedule out the next uh, three or four days uh, so we can drive to get some of the rest of you going, which is helpful. Some people still haven't responded when they can drive. Remember, I would like you to text me and let me know what you have for availability. That way I can start building some type of a uh, a schedule and it would probably be helpful for you if we did come up with some what of a regular schedule like every Wednesday at three o'clock or four o'clock or whatever um, that way you can put it right into your calendar and we're gonna be able to uh, progress through the program and even though you have a late birthday I would still want to drive with people because this class I think is 22 the next class a lot more 26 27 could go as high as 28 so I don't want to get too backlogged with um, with people I still need uh, from some of you I need chapter one make sure that you do the questions uh, that is what you're supposed to do after we sign off the last half hour is for you to read to do your questions send it to me ask questions because sometimes it gets to be a little bit complicated to uh, answer all the questions here on the side for uh, the YouTube questions. But if you do have a question, please put it over on the side and I'll try to answer it. Like uh, George asked a lot of good questions last night and we were talking about that today in the car. Uh, it's really important that you try to, and I know there's a lag from what I'm s saying to what you hear. And then when you respond back, it's probably probably about a minute minute and a half which is kind of long uh, for a response but it's what we have all right let's kind of get out of that so tonight we're going to be talking about your vehicle and more specifically really the driver's ed vehicle because that is going to be your vehicle for the next 10 hours as you go out to show me that you are capable of driving independently and that you are ready to go for your driver's test so last night we talked about licensing. We talked about how to uh, submit an application to the state. Uh, we talked about how you have to pass an eye test, a written test, a road test, which each component, uh, what does it look like, how to actually get through those uh, obstacles to get your license. Uh, we talked a little bit about titling a car, the ownership of a vehicle, registration, and then we started to talk about the HTS. That is where we have to pick up tonight, the highway transportation system. Now remember, it's made up of three things, people, roadways, and vehicles. All right, now, one thing that we didn't mention with, with people, uh, or I, I should say vehicles, anything that has wheels should be traveling in the same direction as an automobile. Anything that is walking, running, they got to be facing traffic. Not everybody does that. Now, when we encounter people on the roadway, this is what I want you to write down. People that are walking or running on the roadway, we have to give them the largest area possible as we go around. I don't want you to buzz by two or three feet. If there are no oncoming cars, I want you to go way over the yellow line. A lot of people are so nervous about going over the yellow line. Now, I'm talking about no oncoming cars. If there are oncoming cars, then we are going to take our time, wait for the vehicle that's approaching us, and then we'll go around the jogger, whoever. It could be a bicyclist going the same direction. But 
today I've started to see a few people kind of buzz by things that we should probably give a little bit more room to when we drive. Okay, more room to obstacles. So I think I'm looking over to the side. Um, where do you submit the homework? Good question, Alan. You're supposed to submit it with your phone. All homework is you're taking a picture. Let me hold up a sticky note. You're taking a sticky note, whatever piece of paper you did your homework on. Could be a big piece of paper like this. You're taking your phone and you're taking a picture of your answers. All right. That's how you're submitting your, your reading homework. Okay. Your reading homework is through the text messages. The pretest, which I think there are three people that still haven't taken it, that's logged into my phone. So I get all the scores. I get to see what questions you got wrong. I got to see how long it took you to uh, do it. I, I think I can even see when you actually took it, what time of day. So it's very, very specific. And we will be having, I don't think today I have a, uh, I don't think I do have one. I think it's next week. Next week we'll have questions that you're going to have to do online on the Facebook page. So every week, week, yeah, about every week, we did the pretest this week. Next week, there'll be another uh, question online that you're going to have to do, and I'll be able to score it and see it. Uh, sometimes it gets kind of, you know, quirky uh, answering questions. So don't be surprised if you've got to fill in um, the blank. It looks like you've got the right answer, but it says it's wrong. I have to go back in and rescore it and take a look at it. So don't get too worried about that if it gives you the wrong score. Um, we do have some worksheets to do today. So let's kind of jump right into where we left off. We'll do the scheduling for driving at the very end of class. But I want you to start thinking about driving. So all day tomorrow I have open, except for I think 5 or 6 o'clock. I'll take a look in a minute. Uh, not driving on Saturday, but I will drive on Sunday. Uh, Monday, I'm open all day. Tuesday, all day. So we're going to start filling up all these study halls that you have that you can drive. But we'll do that at the very end of class. So let's kind of get into what we ended you notice with. There's a volume. Oh, nope, wrong one. There's a volume here on the right. I clicked the wrong one. headphones that plug in. Everybody gather around. I am, there it is. There we go. I hit the wrong button. I've got a big screen here with multiple PowerPoints and videos and everything else that I can access. So. If I don't look real carefully and read what's highlighted, I click on the wrong button. So my apologies. Uh, so we ended off talking about, um, I will be able to let you know about, I see people are texting in about drive times, but I'll, I'll go through at the end of tonight and take a look who can drive when. But I will schedule, excuse me, I will schedule people that haven't driven uh, first. Um. I'm not a big fan of statistics, although I think as an overview of giving you a sense of what they're trying to communicate is probably more important than the actual numbers. So I don't think anybody's going to remember like one out of nine, one out of, out of 83, one out of, you know, 57%. Uh, but I think it should start to make you wonder about how safe or, you know, some of these statistics that we're talking about. So the first one about, about safety, how safe do you think you are in a car? So statistic wise, they say in a given year, and we're talking about new drivers here, about one in nine people will probably have some type of a crash. Now I'm not talking about a serious crash where the car is totaled or someone is injured or dies. I'm talking where you do like $500 worth of damage. It could be, you know, pretty serious. But a lot of times we kind of make light of, oh, it was only a fender bender. It was only $1,500. Take a look at your high school parking lot. How many cars are in the parking lot that have dents or scratches from other vehicles? There's quite a bit. Okay. doesn't have to quite be like that. Now, here's the, the thing that we do have to worry about when we start having crashes where we have injuries, where you have to do some type of rehab. So disabling injuries are where you're going to have to take time to get better, to be made full again. So that means rehabbing. So disabling injuries 
one in 83. Motor vehicle crashes kill about 38% of all people between the ages of 15 and 20. And then 57% of all fatal crashes involve one vehicle. Now, I think the most telling one is the very last one. So I want you to write this down. Most people get so confident after they get their license that they think nothing bad will ever happen to them once they're driving. So they start pushing their speed. They start pushing the distracted driving that they're doing. And they're starting to, to make turns a little bit wider. They're starting to have problems stopping where they're supposed to. And what this last uh, fact is supposed to let you know is that a lot of times your first mistake is your worst mistake because you don't live through it. So making a mistake going, let's say you're on a back road and the posted speed limit is 30, 35. Okay, usually it's 35 on a back road, but let's say you're going 50, 60 miles per hour. It's fine till you get up to a corner. Now you're not able to control the vehicle. You leave the road, you hit a tree, or maybe you cross the center line, you hit an oncoming car. That's a problem because your first mistake was a real, real bad one. Most people, you make a mistake, you learn from it, you go, oh, I got to watch some of these back roads. I got to stop where I'm supposed to. I can't run these traffic lights. And you make minor mistakes. You learn from them. But every once in a while, and here it's saying, you know, that's more than half. And we're talking about new drivers too. Um, this video clip that I want to show you, and we're going to talk a little bit about the local area that we're going to be driving in. So while you're watching this video, this is what I'd like you to do. I want you to think of a place that you have either driven or you've been a passenger and you just thought to yourself, this is dangerous. They should have done something totally different at this particular area. It could be they needed a traffic light. They needed a lower speed. They, make, they need to make the road wider. So I want you to think about a place you have either driven or a place you've been a passenger and I don't need to know particularly the name of the road, but you should be able to let me know about the area. And I want you to text me, okay, not right now, not during the video, but after the video, I'm going to show you a few examples. And then I want you to uh, text me um, round about where you think it is and what could have been done differently to make it safer. So we're going to take a look at how can we make roads safer. site of a fatal accident. This tree is going to be struck again and again and again. This pole has obvious signs of vehicle impact. We're at the location of a serious accident. The driver lost control of the vehicle. Mother and two small children. Wrapped around this utility pole. Let down guardrail that will steer a car. Outdated as of 25 years ago. Ridge columns right along the edge of the roadway on both sides. Highway safety ought to be a priority. The tendency is to put back what was there. As a highway engineer, you should do anything you can to reduce the severity of an accident. This location may seem harmless to drivers that use it every day, when in fact it can be deadly and is loaded with roadside hazards. For example, the large tree located just inches off the edge of the pavement the utility pole on the outside of the curve. Moving down the road a bit, an unprotected guardrail end, which when struck can be deadly and penetrate into vehicles that lose control and come into contact with it. And over here is another large tree located just about a foot and a half off the edge of the pavement and in fact was the site of a fatal crash just last year. Each year in the United States, we have a large number of deaths and serious injuries resulting from single vehicle crashes into roadside obstacles or roadside hazards. 
This has been a problem that's been with us for a long time, and it continues to be one of the leading causes of death and serious injury in this country. Before about 1965, or around that period of time, the highway engineering profession's uh, primary mission was to make a safe roadway. There was also the feeling that once you got off that roadway, you're on your own. It's up to you to get out of a perilous situation. It's their job to provide a good roadway and your job to stay on it. About in the late 60s, the philosophy changed to if a vehicle goes off the roadway, as a highway engineer, you should do anything you can possible to either get them back on the roadway or reduce the severity of, of, of an accident. We learned a lot in the early days of the interstate system how to make these roadside features less hazardous. And so today, the modern interstate system exemplifies the designs that eliminate most serious roadside hazards. And since we've built many miles of interstate system in the United States, the problem has shifted somewhat. But we still have a very serious problem on the many miles of secondary road that are still out there. The most dangerous roads we have now are our rural secondary roads. They have the highest fatality rates. There's where you have very little opportunity to recover if you run off the road. Almost half of all serious roadside hazard crashes occur on curves. Curves to the left are especially hazardous. Signs and pavement markings can help guide drivers around curves, but even where curves are well delineated, drivers can still lose control. And putting signs on roadside hazards isn't the answer. We need to do a lot more than that. One of the major fixed objects uh, along our roadsides, and the one that accounts for probably more fatality than any other single fixed object, are trees. This is an example of the most common problem in the area of roadside hazards, which is trees near the edge of the pavement, especially on curves. On this curve, there are trees right up against the edge of the pavement. And compounding the problem here is a complete lack of protection against drivers striking the trees. The trees are directly in line with any vehicle that loses control around that curve. After trees, utility poles are the most frequently struck object in fatal roadside hazard crashes. Every year in the United States, over a thousand people die in crashes with utility poles. On this pole, you can see the marking and the scarring that's obvious. This pole has been hit many times and is located in a way that will guarantee it will be hit again in the future if it stays here. The way to deal with this problem is also obvious. Utility poles can be set much further back away from the road, creating a clear zone. Utility lines can be buried underground, eliminating the use of poles altogether. And the use of breakaway utility poles is an option. It's appropriate to remove isolated trees that are located in dangerous locations. However, trees and poles are often located in groups, and when this is the case, it's often more appropriate to shield those objects through the use of a safety barrier. Guardrails are the most widely used type of safety barrier, but they're not used often enough to keep cars away from trees and poles. They're very effective, but if guardrails aren't installed properly, they can become hazards in their own right. One problem can be that while they're keeping cars away from one obstacle, they can direct them right into another. This guardrail has been placed in such a way that while it provides adequate protection in some areas, it actually leads vehicles directly into the base of a very large tree, which is very dangerous. The way to correct the situation is to extend the guardrail past all objects on the side of the road and only end or terminate once there's a safe place to do so. We have here a guardrail that's supposed to be protecting you against the bridge rail, but in actuality, it runs you right into the bridge rail if you hit the guardrail. And as we can see, that bridge rail has been hit many, many times. The proper design is to have the guardrail out in front of this bridge rail and attached to it, such that you have a smooth transition from one to the other. Another problem is the end of the guardrail itself, which can become a hazard if it isn't installed properly. 
Now we're at the location of a serious accident uh, with a mother and two small children that went off the left side of the roadway and hit this guardrail. This end treatment, which is like a knife edge, will impale a car, and that's what happened in this accident. The car hit the end of the guardrail, and it actually went up through the firewall into the passenger compartment of this car between two small children. This kind of guardrail is, is uh, outdated as of 25 years ago, but still there's a, there's a lot of these around the country, thousands and thousands of them. Most modern guardrails have a type of end treatment that prevents the impalement of a car. Burying the end of a guardrail can prevent impalement, but it's not the best answer because it can create a different hazard. The solution to this problem is to make the post break away and make it essentially an energy attenuator. This is one of the worst examples of roadside hazards that we've seen. Bridge piers like this one are often located very close to the edge of the pavement. They're especially deadly because of their large size and unyielding nature. At this site, a 36-year-old father of two small children died when his car veered off the road and struck an exposed bridge pier. We don't have to wait for somebody to die at a site like this to improve it. What we had at the site before was an exposed bridge pier that was extremely dangerous. Any vehicle running off the road coming into contact with that area of the bridge could result in devastating injuries. In place now is a properly designed guardrail that's attached to the exterior of the bridge pier. Along with that guardrail is a proper and safe end treatment that allows for a gradual deceleration of vehicles that run off the road. Where bridge supports and other rigid structures can't be safely separated from traffic with guardrails, an alternative is energy-absorbing devices. Crash cushions and other devices can do an effective job of slowing vehicles down gradually. These concepts are simple. Wherever possible, provide a clear roadside that allows drivers a chance to regain control if they leave the road. If a clear zone isn't possible, make sure posts are designed to break away in a crash, and any remaining hazards should be separated from traffic by properly installed guardrails or other energy-absorbing barriers. We at the federal level ran a uh, highway safety improvement program. Under that program, we provided funds to the states to improve high accident locations. That turned out to be a very effective program. Fixing roadside hazards is important because it can prevent a momentary loss of control or a minor crash from becoming serious or life-threatening. Engineering safer roads must become an even more important part of the national strategy to reduce deaths and injuries now that speed limits and travel speeds have increased. There are funds available for renovating and improving highways. It's very important that some of those funds be allocated to fixing the roadside hazard problem. Obviously, we can't fix them all at once. Therefore, it's very important for highway departments to have sensible priority schemes so that they can decide which ones they should fix first. Roads are built by civil engineers, and civil engineers are civil servants. And they tend to do what the public wants. The only way you can get the state and local government to enhance safety on the roadway systems is for the public to want that enhanced safety. And I think they do. Next time you're out on a country road, take a closer look. If you see hazards that shouldn't be there, especially on curves where loss of control is most common, ask yourself why. The answer is that for too long, solving this problem hasn't been a high enough priority. Raise the priority and help make safer roads. Okay, one of the things that they mentioned at the very end of the video was, you know, most crashes are happening on corners. And what I want you to write down into notes, in your notes, it's always wise to go a little bit slower into your turns than to come in too fast and also change your position in your lane. So when you're making a left-hand turn, you want to stay closer to the yellow line because if you're coming in too fast, 
it's going to move you from the yellow line more towards the middle or towards the white line. If you're coming into that left-hand turn too close to the white line and you're too fast, you're going to go into the soft shoulder. So when you're making a right-hand turn, it's just the opposite. You're going to be staying close to the white line. So if you're coming in too fast, it's going to move you to the middle position of your lane because you do not want to go towards the yellow line into oncoming traffic. Most people find themselves at night, and this is why the state requires you to do 10 hours of driving at night, is that you, even though you may know the road, you may forget the speed that you're traveling. And at night, you may be a little bit late with your braking or your steering input to keep you in your lane and you're going off the road or into oncoming traffic. Now, one of the, the signs that they had, and I want to tell you what it is, is Chevron. Okay, so I want you to write this down in your notes, is a black arrow that's pointing in the direction, direction that the turn is going. In most states, the more Chevron signs, and you may have like three, you know, one at the beginning, one at the middle, and one on the far side of the turn. So you're going to have three. So when you start seeing multiple Chevron signs, it's a pretty sharp turn. If you only see one, you could probably go the speed limit and be okay, but you start seeing three or four, that's an extremely tight turn. You better get your speed under control before you go in, all right? And in some states, they use the thickness of the black arrow, meaning that the thicker the black arrow, the sharper the turn. If it's a real thin arrow, it's just a minor turn. And the reason why we have these signs up on roadways is not so much for people driving during the day, but for driving at night where they can't see because roads will have a tendency to, uh, especially in New England, uh, very rarely on back roads are they straight like what we see on highways. They kind of undulate, which means they go up and down and they twist and turn. So there will be moments that you're going to be losing your lines and understanding where the road's going. So it's important when you see a sign, take it to heart and go the speed limit. Now, the other thing that I want you to write down in your notes, because when you go out with me your first drive, I usually take you out around Lee and you're going to encounter some of the Chevron signs and there are yellow speed limit signs. Now, yellow speed limit signs are advisory speeds, which means that you should take that into consideration and go that speed. Do you lawfully have to do that speed? No, because it's not a white sign. A yellow sign is just be aware this is probably what you should be doing, and it will probably help you out. Now, remember, once you get out of the turn, you can go right back to the regular speed. So take those advisory speed limits, you know, to heart and, and try to, to follow those, those speeds. Now, the other thing that they brought up in the video was that governments or local government has a big say and changing what is happening in our area. So when enough people complain about an intersection, they may put up more signs, they may put up a lights. And by the way, we are putting up lights in Durham, brand new lights coming off Route 4, uh, coming into Durham. So on 108, we're having new traffic lights. So Durham is getting another set of traffic lights because there has been so many crashes and so many people complaining about the situation we have now changed what is happening. Now, you're all pretty young, but probably about seven, eight years ago, a lot of the residents in Durham started complaining about people traveling too fast around the schools. So what do we have on Code Drive? We have speed tables. Durham is notorious for having speed tables. We have like four or five of them. I think Dover only has one near the high school but you don't encounter speed tables in many communities. So if enough people complain, they start to do things slightly different. So as I was telling you, and when we were talking in the, or when they were talking in the video about governments, here's a uh, third world com uh, country that thought that a lot of people were going to be moving to a city that they were building. So they said, let's get ahead of the game and build our highways to, uh, accommodate so many people that are going to be moving to our city. Well, guess what happened? Nobody moved. And you can tell by this road, and this is during the day, 
Okay, this isn't like, you know, six o'clock in the morning. Um, this is in um, the middle of the day in uh, Myanmar. Uh, basically, there are 20 lanes of traffic. Can you imagine? Look at people are walking. There are so few cars. People are walking across a 20 lane highway. That's crazy. Um, but they thought this was the wise thing to do. Um, so what I want you to write down right now, and I'm going to give you probably about two minutes to think about an area that you've driven or you've been a passenger that you think that is a little unsafe and try to think about something that's close to home or something that's in Durham. Now, I used to teach driver's ed at a high school north of Rochester in a town called Milton, New Hampshire. Their high school um, was very close to this intersection. So a lot of my driving students would have to get back to the high school and we would have to go around this telephone pole. So the question here is what could be different? Well, definitely the telephone should not be there. Why they would ever put a telephone pole in the middle? I mean, it, it's really in the middle of the road. I mean, it's not just on the curb. It's two feet off the curb. So if you're driving at night and you're not familiar with this area, what do you think the chances are you're going to hit that telephone pole? And notice the only reflector that they have is that little tiny white reflector that's up about four or five feet. Don't you think they should have wrapped that thing in traffic lights or something to, to let people know, hey, there's a pole? And the other thing that makes this pole unsafe, I don't know if you can see it or not, but there is a support wire that's keeping that telephone pole upright. How many of you as kids have ridden your bicycle on a sidewalk? Do you think any 10 year old on a bicycle would see that wire if he's pedaling as fast as he can and he's going to go around the corner to the right right there it's going to take him right off his bike that is so dangerous let me show you a different vantage point of that same pole look how far look how far that is and look at the there's the support wire in the middle of the sidewalk they don't even have it attached to the grass there's so many things wrong with this. And by the way, they have uh, recently changed it. So it's no longer, no longer there. So I want everybody texting into me right now. I want to see where your area. Now, what we saw in the video was telephone poles and guardrails. Those are two concerns we're going to always find when we're out driving in the driver's ed car. So we're going to be very aware if we have to leave the roadway, do we have an area of, of safety to leave the roadway if we had an oncoming car coming towards us? You should always be looking at where could I go if something bad happens. So Lee Traffic Circle, good example someone just brought up. Let's see what else people are writing. So give me some idea. Exeter. Okay. That's a good one, Alan. George has Summersworth off Myrtle Street. I think I know what you're talking about, George. All right. So everybody's got to, so this gives me an idea of who's still on watching because I noticed there are three people that have left class right now. So you, everybody has to put something. This gives me an idea of who is still actively involved with class. Going to give you just a little bit of time. Madbury, that intersection. Zoe, that's good. Mohammed, I don't like that. Mohammed's tough. Uh, Bay Road, um, I think I know what you're talking about, Lyra. Dasha, Wadley Falls, yes, very narrow. Very narrow. Uh, rural roads, Julia says, um, up north. Uh, definitely your mountainous roads are going to have some pretty sharp turns. They're going to be pretty dangerous. Waiting for a few more people to... Skate park. I'm not quite sure about that one. 
You'll have to tell me about that. Okay, back road is in Epping. The train station in Dover, there's a small street. Yeah, our car's parked. Yeah, and the, also there's an intersection there with a traffic light that you don't see until last second, Sadie. That's kind of dangerous. So a lot of the situations that you're going to encounter where you make mistakes may not be you. Okay, a lot of the mistakes that you're making when you're learning to drive may not be you. It could be lack of signs. It could be a bad intersection. But we have to account for or overcome some of these situations, meaning that we've got to be able to process how can we make this better because we can't always rely. Um, Zoe, the turn near PCA, I know what you're talking about. I used to teach driver's ed there too. Uh, the Dover Boathouse, yep, I know that intersection. That's a good one. Alan, you submit it. Um, oh, I see. We already talked about that. Lucy saying downtown intersections in Dover. Um, they can be, depending on which ones. Absolutely. Oh, he, uh, yeah. Uh, Annika is mentioning a place that we were driving. Yeah, absolutely. I'm taking you to intersections and uh, just be on the alert. Uh, because some of you haven't driven with me yet, but the, those that drove with me this week, you know, I'm taking you to some tricky intersections just to see how you handle them. So be on your guard. It's not that I'm trying to trick you, but I'm trying to challenge you. So be ready for a good challenge. Um, I don't have this video anymore. I don't know what happened to it. I, I, when I first heard of this, I said, there's no way there's a traffic jam for nine days. Well, I researched it and it was, it was like a 45 mile stretch on a highway in China. So once you get onto the highway, your next exit was like 40, 45 miles away. They had a major construction problem and all the traffic that was on the highway, they had no place to go. They couldn't get off. There was no way for them to turn around. Um, and people were stuck in their car for nine days. Can you imagine? They were actually on bicycles and motorcycles bringing food to people in their car because they ran out of gasoline and it, it was just a, the biggest mess. You, you should Google it. Google um, nine day traffic jam in China and see what comes up. You're going to be um, you're going to be surprised. Now, throughout the program, I'm going to give you and we, we saw last night that the state exam doesn't just test you what's in the state manual, but they also. Um, test you from the curriculum. So some of what I give you are is terminology. So I want you to write down the word risk. So I want you to know uh, about risk. Risk is the chance of injury to yourself or to others and the chance of damage to your vehicle or property. What I want you to realize is every time that you get into a vehicle and need to go somewhere, there's a risk that something bad can happen. Now, what would lower risk? Well, making sure that you're purchasing a safe vehicle, that you're use, using and utilizing all the safety equipment, meaning that you've got your seatbelt on and um, you've got a car that has decent airbags, good crash rating, um, you're driving responsibly within the speed limit, good position on the road. So you, you can lower the risk of having an injury, but every once in a while we'll read in the paper where actually you can probably read in the paper almost weekly where someone will lose their life in a vehicle. I don't want to be morbid. I don't want driver's ed to be all about blood on the asphalt type of movies and things like that. But I, I do want you to start to think about, I am responsible not only for me, but for my passengers in my car and I'm responsible for the other people on the other side of the road. So I need to make sure that I'm driving to the best of my capabilities. If you take for granted and start driving like it's um, um, Grand Theft Auto, it's a video game, as fun as it's going to be going fast, as fun as it's going to be, you know, taking turns quickly and maybe, you know, spinning out in the snow and stuff like that, something someday bad will happen. I'll almost guarantee it. Uh, so we don't want that to happen. So it's real. 
always take the responsibility of driving seriously. Um, make sure you have these two terms down. We saw this um, Tuesday night in the video from um, Andy Pilgrim. When you're driving recklessly, you're either dangerous or you're vulnerable. So we want to make sure that we understand the severity of, of what we do. So what are other things we can do to reduce your risk? Keep your vehicle in good um, driving condition. Always look out for what other people are doing wrong. That's the anticipation part. This is what, when I take you out for your first drive and I'm evaluating you, I get to see how you move, position your vehicle, where your head is looking, how you're interacting with pedestrians. Um, I, I can usually, even if I don't ask you how many hours that you've done with your parents, I can usually guess within probably 15 minutes of driving with you. I kind of know where you are. Uh, we talked about safety equipment, uh, making sure you're in good physical and mental condition. We kind of talked about that and always trying to make an effort to get better at driving. And that's what we're doing here in Driver's Ed. Uh, these are chapters that we're going to be reading later in week three. So I'm not going to go over this right now. But I do want to just kind of highlight a few things is that the, the beginning of, of learning to drive really starts with looking up ahead down the roadway and having a good understanding of what your responsibility is. Not only where your position on the road is, what speed you should be going, who's to my right, who's to my left, who's in front of me, who's behind me, and you're monitoring everything. So your eyes and your thought process really is the beginning. It's more than just steering, braking, and accelerating. It begins with your judgment in your eyes. It's what you're putting into your head and knowing what you need to do. It, the physical part is, you know, making it happen. But if you don't have good information going into your, into your eyes and into your head, you're not going to be able to steer and make a good maneuver. So it starts with, with your head and your eyes. That's what we're going to really focus on uh, coming up. I do want you to write down these three terms, visibility, time, and space. Uh, visibility is what you can see from behind the wheel, how far you can see. So more distance you can see, the easier it is to figure out what you've got to do up ahead. So when you don't see well, you have less time. And then we get into risky situations, making last minute decisions to turn, to break. And that's when things get a little bit dicey behind the wheel of a car. Uh, time, the ability to judge your speed and the speed of other vehicles uh, and other highway users and then space around your vehicle. Imagine yourself driving with a circle around your car and Consider that circle around your car. Let's say it's like five feet all the way around your feet, your vehicle, five feet in front, five feet to the right, five feet left, five feet behind. Anytime someone gets in that five foot distance near your vehicle, there should be, you know, like a flashing red light going off in your head going, danger, danger, someone's intruding on my space. You should have a sense when things are kind of getting a little bit too close. Now, if I had you in a class, what I would normally do right now when I talk about being comfortable with the space around you, I usually would have someone that's sitting in the front row stand up and I'd walk towards that person and I'd say, do you feel uncomfortable? I'd be three feet away. Then I'd take a small step forward, two feet. Do you feel comfortable? Uh, a little bit less comfortable right now, they would usually say. And then I'd get about a foot from their face. I go, how do you feel right now? And they go, this is a little bit too close. Okay, it should be the same thing when you're driving. You're going to see cars coming next to you, behind you. You go, it's not too bad. Then all of a sudden it's go, uh-oh, they're getting a little bit close. Then they're going to get super close. And then you're going to go, uh-oh, we're so close to something bad happening. And we're going to have to make adjustments and be able to deal with that. Um, I'm not going to do the review questions because that is, um, I'm not going to go through the er er uh, errors either. Um, okay, let's get into knowing your vehicle um, because some of you still haven't driven with me yet. So I wanted to kind of make sure that we get through this tonight. Um, the first time you get into the driver's ed vehicle, um, I'm going to give you instructions left, right, where we're going to go. So you're not, you know, you don't have any say of where we go. I've got planned routes that we're going to take. Uh, I don't mind telling you where we're going to go. 
Uh, I will always give you directions well in advance so you can process it. But sometimes people go, well, Mr. Toll, where are we going to go th this hour? So if you want to know that we're going to Lee and then Madbury and then to Dover and back into Durham doing some lights and intersections, I'll tell you the route that we're taking and what we're trying to accomplish. But for the most part, um, you just have to listen and, and do what I tell you to do. But when you're out on your own, so we're going to kind of make believe you're already a licensed driver. All of you should have some sense of direction. And what I'm saying here is north, south, east, west. If you don't know this already, and I hope that you do, so write this down in your notes, all roadways go in opposite directions. Makes sense, doesn't it? You're driving forward. If you stop and put the car in reverse, you're going in the opposite direction. So if your compass in your car is indicating that you're going north, if you were to spin the car around, do a U-turn, you would be heading south. And then conversely, if you take a right or a left, you're going to be going east or west. I want you to start looking at your route numbers. If you don't know this already, but route numbers are numbered to give you an idea of which direction or where they're headed. So in um, an even first number digit to a state route like 202 is going to go through or around a city. An odd number three digit route, like we have two routes in Durham. We have 108 and 155, one being an odd number. It tells us it will go into a city or a town. So all your routes will give you directions, north, south, east, west. So be familiar. Now with GPS now, it's not quite so important that we need to know because we have people that are talking to us while we're driving on GPS to give us an idea of which direction we need to go. The second thing I want you to think about when you get into a car is, am I really fit to drive? Am I too tired? Do I have any chemicals in my body? They could be illegal. We're going to talk about Ill illegal drugs in a little bit, but they could also be um, prescribed drugs from a doctor. And sometimes prescribed drugs will make you drowsy. And that probably isn't the best thing that you should do behind the wheel of a car. Um, do you have any aches and pains like body um sprains like ankles and shoulders because it may affect the way that you use the pedals or turn the steering wheel and be very careful this happens to all of us okay it's a fact of life we all get excited and we all get depressed you won't believe it but it's true it will affect the way that you drive someone that is really depressed will probably not read signs they're so uh, pondering why you know, let's just say that you got news that um, somebody hit your dog out front of your house. Your dog was killed by a, a driver. Now you've got to drive home. You're going to be a wreck. You're going to be a wreck, emotional wreck. Probably shouldn't be behind the wheel. But let's say that you have to drive home because you're the one that drove to school. You're going to not probably pay attention to speed limit signs. You're not going to uh, probably even come to complete stops. You're going to roll through stops. Same thing about excitement. You know, you're anxious to get that brand new guitar and your parents called and said that Amazon just delivered it. It's at the house now. You couldn't wait to get home quickly. So you may go too fast. That's not the best either. So our emotional state does come into play just as weather does. Rain, fog, snow, darkness, anything that's not 100% clear where we have good visibility on all four sides of our car will affect the way that we drive so in bad weather and we're going to have a whole class on bad weather we're going to change our speed and we're going to change our position on the roadway traffic conditions we have to take into consideration now i put up sometimes that i think are very stressful situations so if you've got less than like five hours of driving i probably wouldn't do a lot of driving during these periods of time you know what it's like before school and after school it, it was kind of ironic. I was in the school this week and I heard the announcement. They told you guys that they don't want anybody driving up co-drive towards the junior high. Everybody leaving the high school has to make a left-hand turn. In all 20 years that I've been in Oyster River, I have never heard the school make that requirement. Things are different right now because of the building of the junior high, 
because of all the buses that have to pick up the junior high kids out on the co-drive rather than in a parking lot. It's crazy. So maybe having your parents pick you up and drive from school may be a little bit stressful for you. And then, of course, when people are going to work, if they're on the highway between 7 and 9 in the morning or 4 and 6 in the afternoon, it can be uh, heavy, heavy traffic like what you see right here. Now, I always like asking this question, so I want people to answer it here on YouTube. Um, you're behind the green vehicle, right? You have four sets of lights, two red, two green. So here's my question for you. Are you in a lane that has a red light or are you in a lane that has a green light? All right. So I want you to um, put your answer on YouTube. I'm going to see how many people. I bet you we get 50-50. Are you behind a green light or behind a red light? Okay. So everybody answer that. I'm going to uh, take a quick drink right here. So I'm not getting any answers because there's so much of a delay, but I'll tell you what the answer is. You are underneath a green light. I actually took this picture from the passenger side. So George says red. Look at that. So we're starting to get some answers now. It, you're actually behind a green light. Everybody's saying red. You may consider it is kind of like a trick a trick question. Let me kind of go back. If you take a look at um the green vehicle and what's off to the left. Um, that is the furthest left lane. So you are underneath a green light. Every single person is saying a red light. No, you're, you're behind a green. Good guess though. All right, let's talk about approaching the driver's ed vehicle. Um, whenever you come to a vehicle, you should, if it's been left unattended for a while, you should always look around the vehicle, meaning you should kind of look to the front, look to the right side, look to the left, maybe even walk around the back. Uh, if it's in a driveway or in a uh, parking lot at a mall, you just never know when glass bottles or anything could be behind the vehicle. And especially if you've got younger brothers and sisters, be aware that they could be toys and things out behind the car. So this is just being wise, making a check that nothing bad's going to happen. And it's really um, disappointing when you read in the news. And I, I don't have the news article. Uh, I'll see if I can get it for next Tuesday. But 
it's really sad when you hear where someone ran over a young child in reverse because they didn't see him. Uh, now with backup cameras and they've got warning systems in cars, things like that shouldn't happen anymore. So look for your tires. Make sure that they look like they're inflated. Uh, and you, the best way to tell a car tires is by using a tire gauge. And I've got one right here. So let me get out of here for a second. So right here is a tire gauge. So this is how you would actually put it on the, the stem. And just like on a bicycle, it's going to uh, give you a, it's going to come out on the side and it's going to give you a reading. Uh, that's the best way to check your tire pressure. Uh, remember, tire pressure can be found on the side of the tire. It can also be found, and the best place to find it is probably um, on the door jam. Okay, when you open up the door on the side, there's going to be a plate that will tell you what your tire pressure should be. But just check around, look for lights, fluids, license plate, uh, windows. Now, carjacking is a different story. Carjacking is basically any time, and write this down, carjacking happens at stop signs, traffic lights, gas stations, and malls. And the easiest way to steal a car is a car that's running. So carjacking is basically taking a video, uh, taking a uh, vehicle that someone has already gotten into and has started. Now, they may still try to take your keys if you're approaching a vehicle and there is nobody else around in the parking lot. Okay, so they don't have to hotwire the car. Uh, the other thing that I sh should have mentioned is always check for small animals too and small children around the car. So that you may want to, you know, hit the side of the vehicle when it's colder temperatures because cats like getting places where it's warm. So here the cat is trying to probably stay somewhat warm. Uh, this was a question, remember, on the state test that I showed you, the, the driver's ed teacher taking the sample test at the DMV? One of the questions was, what should you do uh, before you get into your vehicle and drive out into the roadway? Well, it was to check around the vehicle to make sure that you do all these safety checks. So that was a question. So that's why we're going over it. Uh, here's carjacking. So some of the safety measures to take is to have your keys ready. There is a panic button that you could push that will send off an alarm. Uh, look around to make sure that nothing looks suspicious. You know, so look over your shoulder. Is anybody following you? And always try to stay in a well-lit area so you can see things. And you just never know when someone's going to try to uh, take your vehicle. So here's carjacking. Not this noon, a developing story out of Kalamazoo County. One man is dead, another arrested for the shooting and carjacking. 24 Hour News 8's Tony Taliavia is working this story. He's on the phone right now with new information. Tony? Afternoon, Emily. Investigators tell us the victim has died. He's uh, identified as a 47 year old man from the Vicksburg area. Police say he was shot around 5 30 this morning at the Shell station in downtown Augusta when investigators say a man tried to take the car he was riding in. Police tell us the suspect then tried to take another car but failed and ran away. He ran on foot. Investigators caught up to him about a half mile north of town. They were able to take him to, into custody. We talked with the Augusta police chief who was among the law enforcement officers who, who took him into custody. He said he's glad they were able to take him in relatively soon after the shooting, but of course still sad to hear the news that the victim in this case has died. Police also caught the gun. That's something that they're thankful for, worried that kids in the area might have come across it. We don't know if the suspect in this case will appear in court today. We're going to stay in touch with investigators to try and learn more about that. Neighbors we talked to say they uh, came into work near the Shell station, saw the police, and were just very saddened to hear this news, but very pleased to hear the suspect has been caught and that that gun was found in uh, pretty sad when someone loses their life um, over their vehicle. So if someone's trying to take your car, just give it to them. Your life is way too valuable. Um, but you never know. Sometimes, no matter what you do, people still are going to react the wrong way. Uh, there are a lot of people with mental illness. There are people that are you know, on drugs, and there's no way to reason with them, uh, and they just act irrational. Uh, but this is why, and we're going to talk about this in a minute, uh, one of the the first thing, oh, before we get to that, uh, can you imagine if you lived in Florida 
We said look around for animals or what's around your car, underneath your car. How about this? He'll take a big chunk out of your leg, huh? Uh, so if you're living in Florida, I definitely would be, you know, looking underneath my vehicle. So with carjacking, what I want you to realize is that make it difficult for them to get your car, meaning lock your doors. So the minute you get into your vehicle, lock your doors. Now, in the driver's ed car, once we get up to around six or seven miles per hour, the doors lock automatically. So I haven't been making people lock the doors because I know we're in a safe environment. You're with me. And once we leave the parking lot, the doors will be locked by the time we leave the stop sign. But I will tell you, I've had a situation in Portsmouth and in Dover where someone did try to uh, get inside the driver's ed vehicle while we were stopped at a traffic light. Okay, the doors were locked, but they grabbed the door handle and they were trying to get into the back, the back seat. Um, so these things do happen, but we just have to deal with it. I believe it was mental illness at the time. Uh, I think they thought we were a taxi, to be honest with you. I think he thought we could give him a ride. I don't think he was trying to, you know, steal the car. I think he was trying to get somewhere. Once you get inside the car and you've locked it, then adjust your seat. You should be in a comfortable position. When you adjust your seat, you should be able to see well over the steering wheel and there should be a slight bend to your arm. Okay. Uh, don't be surprised if you think that you look like you're in a good, comfortable position. I may change it. I may ask you to get closer or further back um, because I want you to start to have a better posture uh, in driving so you can grab the steering wheel to make better turns. Um, it may be a little bit against of what you feel is right, but I think um, it's important for you to understand that I'm seeing that you're either too low or too far away. That's usually the case. Um, sometimes it's too close, but not normally. So I want you to put you in the best uh, driving situation possible. So once you've adjusted the seat, then what I want you to do is to lock your seatbelt. Now, it, there is only two people in the car when we drive, you and me. But when you get to be a licensed driver, I want you to understand that any, and write this down in your notes, you are liable. So write down, you are liable for everyone in your vehicle. I know it's a big responsibility and you probably don't want to hear it, but once you start driving, if you are involved in a car crash, you've got to pay for all the injuries to everybody that's in your car. It's on your insurance. It's on your parents. So if you don't have very good insurance and you get in a car crash and let's say that someone's in the hospital for a week and there's $60,000 worth of medical bills, that's going on to your parents because you're driving on your parents' policy or you're under the age of 18. So be smart. Think about what you're doing because it will have an adverse effect on your parents. Uh, lastly is adjust your mirrors and always adjust your mirrors while you're sitting uh, upright in your seat like you're driving down the road. A lot of people that I've had drive uh, yesterday and today, when I've asked you to do your mirrors, you're moving your body way, way too much when you adjust your mirrors. You should be sit sitting behind the steering wheel or maybe even one hand on the steering wheel like you're driving and use your left hand to uh, use the toggle switch to move the mirrors up and down. If you take a look at the bottom picture, that's the side mirror, and that's what I want you to see in your side mirror, a very small portion of the side of the vehicle. The rear view mirror, see as much of the back window as you possibly can. Now, on newer vehicles, they will even have a blind spot detector that will flash, letting you know. Notice in the bottom picture, there's a van that's coming up on the side. Well, you know, once it leaves that side mirror, where did it go? You're not going to see it any longer. So that's why you always have to make a shoulder check or have a car that has a blind spot monitor to give you an idea that there's a car there. Now, in the driver's ed car, we don't have that, but we do have a uh, convex little circle mirror that will eliminate the blind spot. And we can use that to see traffic that's coming up to the side of us. Now, when you take a look at your rear view mirror in this picture, you can see there's a white truck to the left and then there's a sedan off to the right. 
Well, guess what? You can see those two vehicles also in your side mirrors. So it corresponds. Okay, so you see it and then you see it again. It's not two separate vehicles. It's the same. It's the same vehicle. So if we were to take a look from a bird's eye view of the situation, there is an overlap of your side mirror in your rear view mirror. And a lot of textbooks will tell you that's redundant. You shouldn't have that. So what you need to do is to push your mirrors out a little bit further. You'll notice in this next picture, notice in this next picture, we do not see the pickup truck to the left or the sedan off to the right. So as it leaves the rear view mirror, it will start going uh, off to the left or off to the right into your field of view. And it will help you eliminate some, not all, but some of your blind spot. If you take a look at the picture down below, you can see that when the vehicle to the left or to the right almost gets nose to nose with you, they're slightly behind you. You're only going to see a very little bit of the car in um, the, re the rear end of their car in your side view mirror. And then your peripheral vision will probably um, take over and you'll be able to see them coming up. Um, in your side vision. Um, you should be familiar with how to start a car. We don't have keys in the driver's ed vehicle. It's just a power button and the state doesn't want me having you start the car. So I have to do it. Uh, the only thing that you can do is use the, um, the shifter, um, to the gear selector to get it into the gear that you want to use. And this is why I have to wipe down the steering wheel and the car and everything. Um, but we need to be somewhat familiar with uh, movement of the vehicle. So let's talk about the gear selection. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because I think we know most of it. But you'd be surprised. I'll tell you a story after I go through this. Uh, of course, your car has to be in park when you get out of the car. So after you're done driving, you're always putting it into the park position. Uh, you may set the parking brake if you want on your family vehicle, but normally I don't have students use the parking brake um, unless we're on a hill. If we're on a hill, I'll have you use the parking brake, but on level ground, as long as we're in park, we're fine. Reverse, of course, is for getting out of parking spaces and driveways. Usually in reverse, you can't go very fast. You probably top out around 15, 18 miles per hour. It's a very low gear. Most people don't travel that fast in reverse. Maybe seven, eight, nine miles per hour in reverse is, is fast. So to get on the top end, um, I don't know why you'd want to go that fast in reverse. Neutral in your notes you can put down is this is for uh, having your car towed. If your car breaks down and you have to get a tow truck to come out, they're going to require you to be in neutral. Oh, another time you're going to use neutral is if you go through a car wash. Okay, you got to put your car in neutral when they pull you through the car wash. You can't be in reverse or drive. Um, D is for drive. That's the forward gear. So that's for normal driving. But then there are two gears or one gear just below drive. It's low one, low two. In the driver's ed vehicle, it's B. Um, it gives you more pulling power, more torque. Uh, we use it for bad weather. We use it if we were going to tow anything. But just be familiar, there is another drive position below drive um, to help you get unstuck or to pull you up a hill in bad weather. And that's what's used for. Now, I was going to tell you, the reason why I go over this, why is that I had a student once, we were in a parking lot and we were supposed to drive through an empty parking spot. So we were parked in a parking spot with an empty spot in front of us. I wanted to drive through that empty spot to leave, to go to the exit, because I knew that there were people walking behind us. Well, the student put it in reverse and hit the gas pedal, and we went backwards rather than forward through that empty parking spot, and we almost hit a few pedestrians. And I said, why did you put it in reverse? And they go, oh, I thought R was for ride. They thought R was for ride. So there are people that haven't driven much and they weren't paying attention when their parents were driving and they don't know where some of these things are. So this is why we have to go through all these selections. 
So this is what it looks like in the driver's ed car. Notice the funky shift position. So you have to go way over to the right and then down to get it into reverse neutral and drive. And there's that lower gear, that B that I was talking about. Uh, steering wheel, I don't really care how you grab the wheel. It could be 10 and 2, uh, 9 and 3, 8 and 4. As long as you got both hands on the wheel and you're making decent turns, I'm okay. And to make a turn, I want you to do hand over hand where you're turning a half of a turn from the top of the steering wheel, or you can do the push-pull steering technique where you just kind of grab and shuffle the steering wheel from the bottom portion, but you must drive at a much slower speed in order to do push-pull correctly and smoothly. I'm kind of a firm believer of hand over hand for like 80% of turns, and then maybe push-pull for parking or you know, traffic circles, things like that. And then one hand backing. I do not mind if you use one one hand for, let's see, let me get out of here for a second. I don't know why my mouse is not working. Okay, one hand for backing. So you put one hand at 12 o'clock and then you're looking, over your sh you're looking over your shoulder while you're backing. I don't mind one hand backing. Hand over hand is turning from the top Push pull is turning from the bottom. Okay, those are the two, two techniques that we were talking about. Um, remember, do not rest your hands in the middle portion of the steering wheel where the horn is. We have an airbag. So if we ever had a crash, their airbag is going to come out. There is a tilt position on the steering wheel, so make sure it's very comfortable. And I'll almost bet no one will use the horn. It's the, the least used item on a car is the horn. Think about it. Why do they put a horn on a car? When was the last time you heard someone use a horn? Usually it was out of disgust. They're using the horn because they're angry. A horn is to let people know, hey, I'm here. You don't see me. I'm here. Could be for a pedestrian. It could be a, a car downtown that's backing out of a parking spot. So there's my wife. She's doing one hand behind the seat for backing up and here she's got hand position for doing hand over hand she's getting ready to make a left hand turn so she's going to lead with the right and then cross over with the left and then push pull your hand position is much lower eight and four and you're going to push and shuffle the the wheel now the reason why i put this picture in here is that we all know that the gas or accelerator pedal is the furthest pedal to the right it goes vertical and the pedal to the left which is horizontal is the brake pedal you should have your heel on the floor and pivot between the two now most of you don't know but there is a piece of plastic that looks like a pedal that's off to the left of the brake what is a dead pedal why is there a dead pedal why should i have my foot there Okay, there are two reasons, so write this down in your notes. A dead pedal is to keep your foot away from the brake pedal. That's the most obvious one. It also puts you squarely in your seat, okay, with your legs perfectly spaced, your right and your left leg, in order to make turns. But the real reason that you have a dead pedal is if you come into a turn too quickly. And let me, let me get out of here for a second. If you're turning too quickly and your body's going to your body's going to move when you turn too quickly. I mean really fast into a turn. You've probably been in the back seat when someone's taking a fast turn. Everybody's leaning when they make that turn. Well, if you're the driver and your body's leaning and you have a crash, the airbag is coming over here. When you take your foot that's on that dead pedal and you think you're taking a turn too fast, push on that left foot. That's going to push your upper body up against the back of the seat and it's going to keep you upright. So if you do have a crash, then the airbag is going to give you, you know, the benefit of the airbag is going to be maximized. But if you're leaning, you're going to be going around the side of the airbag when it comes out and it's not going to be, it's not going to be useful to you at all. So there's the dead pedal in the driver's ed car. Uh, let's talk about some 
terminology. I want you to write these down. Uh, this will be on the midterm. This will be also be on the final. So write these down. First one is light acceleration. And you don't have to write everything down. Everything that I have up here, just kind of listen and just write down maybe just a few things to remind you. It's basically what, what I want you to write down. It is used for smooth starts. And you're using it at the beginning of a turn from a stop position. Just write the bottom two. A smooth start from a stop sign, traffic light. The beginning of a turn or going through an intersection. That's light acceleration. You can feel the car just gradually pick up speed. Next term, progressive acceleration. This is where you're putting steady increased pressure on the gas pedal to get up to the speed limit. Once you are at the speed limit, you're maintaining that pressure and holding your speed at the limit that's posted. So once you go from light acceleration, then you get more aggressive or progressive and you get up to the regular speed that you should be traveling and then maintain it. Next term, cover brake. Cover brake is when the ball of your foot is hovering over the brake pedal. And this is the term that I like, anticipation. So cover brake, just write down, is anticipating what you think is going to happen. I think that person's going to walk across the road. I think the light's going to change. I think the person's going to open up their door. I see them inside the parked car. So this, I can tell. I can tell a good driver because they have better anticipation. People that haven't driven much will miss all these things and I'll mention it and they go, oh, I didn't see that. No, you were so nervous. You were so in tuned into keeping your car in your driving, in your lane that you didn't see what could have happened. Good thing it didn't happen. When you're going down a big hill, you may cover the brake. You don't need to slow down quite yet, but you're going to be ready if you have to. That's what cover brake is. Control braking, just put down regular braking. Firm, steady pressure, making your car stop, non-emergency situations, stopping at your stop lines right where you need to be. And you want to feel a slight pitch. Now, what I mean by a pitch is the car is going to dip a little bit forward and then back. Okay, so it's going to dip forward and then it's going to dip backwards. Okay. Now, what is a limousine stop? A lot of people go, why... You know, why is this so important? I will tell you, and let me get out of here. Whoop. A limousine stop. Think about it. If you've ever been in a limousine, a driver has been trained. So when he drives, that when he comes to a traffic light or a stop sign, people in the back don't drop their drinks or their food or, you know, fall off the seat because a lot of times they don't have their seatbelt on in a limousine. So a limousine stop is trying to stop your vehicle 10 feet from the stop line. I don't mean complete stop. So you look at your stop line, try to think about where 10 feet would be back from there. And as you drive, say, I'm going to drive and I'm going to stop about 10 feet. And just before you stop at that 10 foot po uh, point, you let, go of the, you let go of the brake pedal a little bit. And then you coast up the last 10 feet and you're not going to have a very heavy, you know, pitch of the vehicle. The, the vehicle is not going to pitch forward that much. That's a limousine stop. So it's slowing down 10 feet from the stop, then letting go of the brake a little bit and going up the last. You're barely going to feel the car pitch. There's going to be a very smooth resting stop. Some of you, when I drive with you, when we stop, the head snaps. There's a real snapping of the head. That means you're not used to the, the brakes on the driver's head car yet. Trail braking is lightly decreasing pressure on the brake pedal when you're inching into a parking spot, when you're backing out of a driveway. The limousine stop will have a trail brake aspect to it. Inching forward in traffic, like you're on a bridge and it's stop and go. You're on the brake, you're letting go of the brake. You're pushing down on the brake to stop it. You're letting go of the brake. So every movement of the vehicle, it's either pushing down or letting go to move and stop the car. So that's trail braking. Okay. You basically are probably moving at a walking pace. 
When the car's idling and you let go of the brake, you could probably walk beside the car. So it's a very slow pace to it. Threshold braking I want you to write down is maximum pressure on the brake pedal. Um, a child runs in front of you. An animal runs in front of you. If someone locks up their front brakes in front of you, you don't want to hit something. You're hitting the brakes as hard as you possibly can. I want you to realize that you cannot break the brakes. So when you hit the brakes, you're hitting it as hard as you possibly can. And it's for an emergency. The other thing I want you to remember about the brake and the accelerator, most people haven't thought of it this way. Think of, uh, think of the gas pedal. Everybody thinks the gas pedal makes you go faster, which it does. That's why the term accelerator. But have you ever thought that if you let go of the, the gas pedal, you do slow down. You don't slow down a lot, but you do slow down. So when I say you're going too fast, I'm not saying use the brake pedal. I'm saying let go of the accelerator and find the speed that we should be traveling. Conversely, same thing with the brake. When we hit the brake, we think we're stopping the car all the time. Well, guess what? If we let go of the brake, we start moving again. So when I say when we're going into a parking space, okay, we got to move up a little bit further. I'm not saying move up as in hit the gas pedal to move up. I'm saying do the trail braking that I mentioned, and that's going to get you up into your parking spot. So just remember that. And we've already talked about the parking brake. Uh, gauges real quick. Um, speedometer is off to the left right there. Somebody in the car does not have their seatbelt on. When I took this picture, uh, the yellow light uh, indicates that I had a maintenance requirement, which was an oil change. Um, the kind of greenish light that is on top next to the yellow means the car is on and the green light down below in the circle indicates we're running on battery power because the driver's ed car is a hybrid. So we do not use gasoline when we're stopped. We're using our battery power. So make a scan for your gauges. You should know where the speedometer is. The odometer tells how many miles the car has driven. That's really useful for selling a vehicle. Uh, same thing with tripometer is helpful to gain some information on gas mileage, but we're not going to use that in driver's ed. Uh, I do require you to look at the fuel gauge and let me know when we're getting too low on fuel. Uh, I have to pump gas right now until they lift the COVID stuff. They don't want you grabbing any gas handles, you know. So until everything is back to normal, um, you're limited to what you can do in the driver's ed car. But uh, hopefully all of you know how to fill up with gas. And we'll probably talk a little bit more about that a little bit later. Um, the next three I want you to write down and just, and this is in your reading. So hopefully you've, you've got this down anyways. An alternator gauge or warning light means electrical problem. That's all I want you to know. So if you see a warning light come on or an alternator gauge uh, indicate it's electrical problem. Temperature gauge means your engine's running too hot. So try not to drive the car. You're going to damage it. <clears throat> a brake warning light means there's brake problems, usually low brake fluid level. Now, it doesn't mean you don't have brakes, but your brakes will not be the same. They won't be as effective um, as they normally are. So look for a safe place to pull over. Oil pressure gauge or light will indicate there's not enough oil being pumped through the engine. So make sure you don't drive the vehicle, pull over, uh, check the oil level. I always carry an extra quart, although I don't have it uh, right now in my trunk because I just had my oil changed. Uh, I had to use the quart, so I've got to replenish. I always ke keep a, an extra quart in my car in case it gets a little bit low. And then the other thing is everybody should know uh, where their lights are. Not just your headlights, but your parking lights, your... Um, backup lights, your emergency flasher lights, where is your high beam um, lever? Wh when do I know that my seatbelts are activated? Now, this I do want you to write down. Any warning light that's on the vehicle that is red, so write this down. A red warning light indicates an immediate problem. A yellow light on your dashboard indicates it's a concern something 
you should be thinking about and get checked out. Red is more serious than yellow, right? So just know your, your light colors mean something. Um, be comfortable in the driver's ed car with heat or air so we can adjust the temperature or the fan. I normally don't use the radio to start off with, but at some point, well, I probably do have it on. Uh, don't be surprised if my phone goes off because I'm in the car so much. I think people think I have an office. Really, my driver's ed car is my office. I try not to talk on the phone while I'm giving you instruction, but every once in a while, I'll have to pick up, especially if it's a family member. They know they're only calling me if it's really seriously a serious situation. Most of the time, they'll text me. So that's on the steering wheel. And then down on the floor, there's a uh, gas release and a trunk release and a hood release. So know where those are located. Uh, headlights are at the end of your directionals. So spin the end of your directionals to turn on your headlights. Uh, wipers are going to be off to the right of your steering wheel. All right. So uh, we're right near the end of today. So what I'm going to show you right here, I've got this slide of warning symbols. And then I have this slide of warning symbols. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to post them on Facebook in about five minutes. And at the end of five minutes, you can go onto Facebook and download them so you can do these worksheets. I'm also going to give you a worksheet of knowing your vehicle, which means you're going to have to go to your glove compartment in your vehicle that you're going to be driving at home, take out the car manual, bring it inside and look at your worksheet. You can use the worksheet, um, the owner's manual for the worksheets that I'm giving. So one is symbols or two pages are symbols. And then there's going to be one page on know your vehicle. And I don't think I have that one um, that I can throw on. I don't think I have it up here. I don't see it. Sometimes I leave it on the top of my, my screen. Let's see if I can find it real quick. Hold on. Let's see if I can find, find it, find it. Yeah. Let's see if it works. Oh, it's not coming over. Yeah, it's got to be a, it's got to be, a, oh, there we go. Oh, no. Let me get out of Hold on. Let me show you the screen. There you go. There it is. That's what's going to also be posted on Facebook. Know your vehicle. So you got to put your name on it, make and model of your vehicle. Uh, find out what a VIN number is. Okay. This, you're going to have to talk to your parents maybe about that. Recommended gasoline grade. That's recommended for your um, vehicle. Gasoline tank size. Recommended oil. How much should be added at an oil change. Tire size. Then I'm going to ask some questions about fuses and bulbs. Uh, have your, your dad help you with stuff like this. And then the bottom part is drawing your engine compartment, what it looks like. And that will be in the owner's manual. So that is going to be on Facebook too. So there'll be three worksheets that we're going to be doing. Now, for the rest of you, let me get out of here. Um, I need you to text me right now. So tomorrow I'm wide open. I know some of you I've got down that Allen. I think we could probably drive um, early morning at 8 or 840, whatever that time is you can. Uh, George, could you take 12 o'clock? Just text me. Let me know. I've already got Griffin scheduled for, um, I don't know. Do I? Let me see. Who do I have? I've got someone tomorrow at 1. Hold on. Cooper. I got Cooper. Cooper, you're driving at uh, one tomorrow. I've got three, four, and five open tomorrow afternoon. Uh, like I said, let me know if you can drive on Sunday. I'll drive a little bit on Sunday. Monday, I can drive. Tuesday, I can drive. So right now, I want you to text me what your availability is, when you can drive for the next four or five days, and we'll try to 
go back and forth with text messages and get everybody scheduled. So I'd like to start driving with most people. So that's it for our first week. We did not get to manual transmission. We're going to pick up on Tuesday on airbags, uh, seatbelts, and helmets, and I'll be discussing a project that you're going to have to do for that. Uh, but do your reading because I still haven't gotten uh, chapter four or five from a lot of you. So please do that. That's tonight's uh, class that we had. So finish up on the reading and doing the questions at the end of those chapters. So that is it for, um, but that's it for tonight. So we will talk to you tomorrow. Uh, not tomorrow. We'll talk to you on Tuesday at class, but hopefully we'll be scheduling some driving. All right. So go to Facebook and I'll have that posted in five minutes and I'll start looking at who can drive. All right. Have a good night.